Welcome. I'm Warno Deschalette, and this is A Baha'i Perspective. Welcome to A Baha'i Perspective. I recorded an interview with Serge Frazenkevich on September 20th, 2021. Serge is an accomplished jazz pianist, arranger, composer, and educator. Serge has an early education bilingual school based on the arts called Affinity Arts, which we talk about in the interview. In the interview, we play a number of Serge's original compositions. I started the interview by asking Serge where he grew up. And what was religious life like growing up? Well, I grew up in Brasilia, capital of Brazil, and I was born into a Baha'i family. My parents were pioneers from the United States, and they started pioneering to different countries in the 60s. This was after the Universal Social Justice was formed. The Universal Social Justice is a governing body for the Baha'is, and we don't have a church and there's no clergy, but we have an administration system. And the Universal House of Justice was elected with nine members. The first one formed in 1963. And at that point, my parents started these voyages, these trips, to help carry out the message of Baha'u'llah, founder of the Baha'i faith. So it was encouraged at that time for believers to take pioneering posts, And they went to different countries, to Colombia, Venezuela, Brazil, and South Africa as pioneers. And it was in South Africa, actually, where my brothers were born. I have two brothers and a sister. And that was quite a difficult pioneering post because of the apartheid regime and the terrible racial tensions, segregation that was happening. And that's pretty much the opposite to the principles of the Baha'i faith about equality and elimination of prejudices, all types of prejudices, including racial prejudice. So it was a very difficult time for my parents to be there because as Baha'is, we have to obey the laws of the country. And there were guidelines of the universal justice that they would have to be very careful if they wanted to stay in South Africa. But there was a point that they had to fill a form out to renew their visa or something like that. And there was the religion question, and they put that they were Baha'is. Baha'is, we cannot lie about that. We have to say, yes, we are Baha'is. This is who we are. That was probably the point that the government asked them to leave, and so they were deported from South Africa. As they returned to the U.S., they felt that they couldn't stop. They felt they had to continue pioneering. So they decided to come to Brazil. My parents are musicians and educators. They had gotten jobs working in schools and in orchestras in these different countries. When they came to Brazil, the first place they went to was Porto Alegre, and they worked in a school there. Since they were having a lot of difficulty getting a permanent visa in Brazil, they were thinking of changing countries again. There was an offering of a job in Hungary, but they didn't know exactly what to do. So they sent a letter to the International Teaching Center, which is an organization that works straight with the Universal House of Justice. And they asked what they should do in this situation. In return, they had actually received an actual letter from the Universal House of Justice telling them that it was preferable that they stay in Brazil and that they would pray for them. Soon after, it was pretty unexpected, my mother was surprised with the news that she was pregnant and that made it all possible to apply for a permanent visa. So they were able to stay in Brazil. So after that, my dad got a job. He got another job this time in Jari. This is north of Brazil. It's the complete opposite of Porto Alegre. They were in the south of Brazil, and then they went all the way up to the north of Brazil. 
this is in the Amazon jungle, and that's where I was born. <laughs> it's quite a story. So life must have been fairly rustic growing up there after you were born? Yes, very much so. Interesting enough, the hospital, my mother had to give birth to me, you know. It was just a little cabin. An Indian woman was giving birth at the same time. And when I started crying, the Indian woman picked me up and gave me to my mom straight. I and mean, it was so much more human and so interesting. And everything worked out. Is that the area of Brazil that you grew up? No, actually, we stayed there for a little short while. And my dad got another job at the University of Manaus, still in the Amazon. So we went to Manaus and stayed there for about two years. He got a job as a double base professor at a federal university. Once you get into a federal university in Brazil, you're able to create a lot of channels with other universities throughout Brazil. And that's what he did. He was able to make a connection with the University of Brasilia. A job was offered in Brasilia, so he went to Brasilia. We all settled. The whole family stayed, and we live till today in Brasilia. Serge, you said that you grew up as a Baha'i. One of the tenets of the Baha'i faith is that one should independently investigate truth for themselves. And another principle is that a young person at the age of 15 is considered at the age of maturity in which they can decide for themselves what spiritual path they want to follow. And I'm just wondering, and maybe it's, there isn't, but I'm just curious if there was a time during that age, earlier or later, that you somehow transitioned from being a Baha'i in your family to being a Baha'i independent of your family and owning the Baha'i faith for yourself. I think for me it was a very organic process, a very natural process. There's something else I need to say about a little bit of this history because I think it affects it. This pathway, this spiritual pathway I was going through. See, my parents had in Brazil already worked in several schools as a director, as a teacher. They already had three kids with them and three boys. And they weren't exactly really happy with the kind of education that was offered. They felt it was a little bit too traditional. There are special writings in the Baha'i faith that talk about education. They wanted to really try to get the children closer to those ideals that they've been developing. My parents teamed up with another Baha'i American couple that was also pioneering in Brazil at the time. They came up with the idea of founding a school, which is the School of the Nations. The School of the Nations actually is quite a, a reference school in Brazil. It is a Baha'i-inspired institution, and its curriculum is based on the principles of the Baha'i faith. The main foundation of the school is based on the idea of unity, that we are all world citizens and we live in a global community. But because the school resides in Brasilia, there was quite, and there is quite a large diplomatic community. We had over 50 nationalities in the school represented, possibly even more, 60 nationalities. I have friends from all over the world. I was able to learn about their different backgrounds, cultures. And this really helped me to learn about very important things about th this world, about tolerance, respect, and to even celebrate these differences we have with each other. I remember some of the activities we had there, like the Festival of Lights, where the children would learn about the many religions in the world, and the United Nations Festival, where we learned about so many different countries and their cultures. So basically what was happening was that a whole new culture was being developed. I felt the spirit of unity in that school, a new culture of acceptance of unity and of love. It was really a really beautiful thing to me, and it was such a support throughout my childhood and adolescence. And not only did I have contact with Baha'i principles during 
school hours, but some of the activities of the Brasilian local com communities. So we have also, besides the school, we had a small community of Baha'is. We had a lot of our events happening at the school. We had Baha'i children classes. We had the 19-day feasts. The 19-day feasts, 19 days represents a month for the Baha'is, and, and we have a feast at every Baha'i month, which is made of 19 days. Later on, when I was a teenager, a Baha'i youth group, we also had many conventions and conferences there. We had a choir, we had a drama a group, we had different presentations in different cities. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. But the main thing is really that we had a lot of good friendships going on, and the feeling of unity was fantastic. At the school, also, we had holy days that were celebrated as well. And my family usually produced the music for many of these celebrations. So this was basically the religious atmosphere I grew up in. But coming back to your question about what led the spiritual journey, yes, like I was born in a Baha'i family and brought up in a Baha'i-inspired school. But yes, there is a need, right? There's a need to take the extra step, independent step on this never-ending spiritual journey because we, we never end. It's always a, a growing process. In the Baha'i faith, it talks about acquiring virtues and that this process is never-ending. We'll be always doing this. We'll be always developing, and we have to always search to be better people at each day. I feel that there were two things that really helped me in this journey to become more independent in this soul-seeking For me, the study of history was very important. I have a degree in history from the University of Brasilia, and it has helped me to think of the big picture of the important processes mankind has gone through. I mean, we see in history, you know, from the Dark Ages to Enlightened Ones, the, the ruptures and continuities in history, the tensions and crises, how many revolutions in history the rise of diplomatic relations between countries and so forth. So for me, the understanding of history gave me a very good perspective, well, at least a better perspective, of the crumbling of the old world order and the unfolding of a new one. So I think having this scope has made it all easier to understand like to a rational level. And I believe the guardian, the guardian of the Baha'i faith is Shoghi Effendi, and he was the grandson of Abdu Baha. Abdu Baha was the son of Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith. Abdu Baha for the Baha'is is the perfect example to the Baha'is. So the grandson of Abdu Baha encouraged the believers to study history. The other dimension that really helped me out with this search for spirituality has been a dimension where my heart and soul speaks out, and that is music. And I believe there's a special resonance in music that really connects our soul to the spiritual world. I know that in the Baha'i faith also we can find many sacred writings which talk about the importance of arts and the spirituality linked to it. I love a passage of Baha'u'llah where he says, we verily have made music as a ladder for your souls, a means whereby they may be lifted up into the realm on high. So speaking of music, how old were you when you realized that music was going to be the central theme of your life? Well, music really has been uh, for many generations in my family. It's always been a part, actually, it goes back several centuries. We have in our family musicians, well, 200 years ago, possibly, Joseph Slavik, that he was a good friend of Chopin. On both sides of my family, mother and dad, they both have a lot of musicians. I mean, it's what you do in my family. It's the heart of the family. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
my memory of music goes back way back you know i can remember memories as a two-year-old with music i started to play the violin at the age of four my mother taught all of us three brothers and a sister the violin starting around age three four and then each one kind of branched off to the instrument they wanted to play so i took on the piano at seven but i was studying classical music my brother is a concert pianist it was quite funny actually at the time because he's older than i am he was like a prodigy he was a fantastic player and i wanted to be like him i wanted to play just like him i remember trying to get his songs you know his complicated songs but i wouldn't be able to read them mm-hmm. so i would play them by ear as much as i could and i think that kind of developed my ear into a more like a jazz like ear because jazz musicians have to they have good ears i mean that's very important for a jazz musician but it was around when i turned 13 or 14 i believe that was like the big turning point for me as a musician because my dad started to show me some important elements some concepts about jazz harmony and an improvisation and he would play with me he would jam with me on the bass and we would spend hours jamming i can tell you it was like a whole new world being opened up to me the process of a classical pianist to improvise it's not so easy you kind of have to turn the dial it's like in another mode and my dad really facilitated that with me i was able to get into that channel of creativity and improvisation and besides that i was pretty much hooked on the records i would spend many hours a day some some days i would spend four five six hours just listening to records and trying to play along with them practically copy really try to copy what they were doing on the piano i would listen to oscar peterson or tatum Errol Garner, George Shearing, Dave Brubeck, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, the Brazilian pianist as well, Tom Jobim, João Donato, César Camargo Mariano. So we have a lot of great pianists here as well. In my later years, I would listen to Chick Corea, Bill Evans, Mauro Miller, McCoy Tyner, Benny Green. But I also love the organ as well. There's something about the Hammond organ that I really got into. I started listening to Jimmy Smith, Milt Buckner, Joey DeFrancesco, Larry Goldings, and so forth. Well, that's on the key side. Of course, we have all the horns, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Dizzy Gillespie, Clifford Brown, John Coltrane, Miles Davis. I mean, it, just, it never ends. It's just a whole new world to me. Quite exciting. But there was a point that, because my dad was a bass professor at the University of Brasilia, at one moment they needed a pianist to accompany the jazz combo that they were forming. I was about 14. Well, this combo later turned into a big band, and I played many years in that big band. But I had this very special opportunity to jam and be part of this combo at a young age and learned with university students. I think that pretty much triggered me to start working and start practicing. From then on, I took jazz as my main goal on the musical front. I had my first gigs at the age of 17. I never stopped. <laughs> mm-hmm. And Serge, I understand you founded an early education bilingual school based on the arts? In English, it's called Affinity Arts International School. What inspired you to start this school? Well, this is a family-run school, my family enterprise. And we had, of course, the help of my parents' experience with the School of the Nations to create Affinity Arts. I truly believe that the, the inspiration came from the understanding the importance of the arts and the Baha'i teachings on education. Can I read a quote of Abdu'l-Baha about education? Yeah, sure. So again, Abdu'l-Baha is the son of Baha'u'llah, the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith. Sure, go ahead. He said, O ye recipients of the favors of God, 
In this new and wondrous age, the unshakable foundation is the teaching of sciences and arts. According to explicit holy texts, every child must be taught crafts and arts to the degree that is needful. Wherefore, in every city and village, schools must be established, and every child in that city or village is to engage in study to the necessary degree. So I feel the big difference of affinity, the school that we, we founded, is that we decided to immerse our students in the arts as much as possible. So we teach music, drama, dance, we have yoga, the arts, besides the other academic subjects. One thing really helped us to understand the importance of the arts were studies that started to be made in the 90s. There were several studies. One of them was the Mozart effect. They revealed the impact of the arts with children, especially on depression of brain development. See, the brain goes through a real revolution when you practice a musical instrument. They made CAT scans, you know, with the brain, with children playing and adults as well the brain will light up. So they saw that there's a huge potential in developing the brain through music and musical instrument. So we decided to teach music every day at the school. The children learn violin and piano within the school hours. So usually children, they learn their instruments in after school programs, but we've decided to give the same importance to music as other subjects. And not only that, we also learned that the arts can be a, a beautiful tool to teach academic subjects. So we have here a curriculum based on interdisciplinary approach. And we found that it's a lot more effective than traditional ones. And I remember another quote actually by Pablo Picasso and I think it pretty much summarizes what we do here. He said, all children are born artists. The problem is to remain an artist as we grow up. So, Serge, I understand that you have your own jazz ensemble under your name. And I requested that you select a few musical compositions from your ensemble. What's the first piece that you selected to play? I selected a song called Blues for Sanders. This was my first composition I made. This goes way long back, and I made this especially for my grandpa. My grandpa actually was a huge influence in my musical career. He was a jazz pianist and worked professionally for probably over 60 years in the city of Chicago. He had some appearances with some great jazz legends like Louis Armstrong, Ella Fitzgerald, and other legends. I didn't really have much contact with my grandpa. I visited the States several times, like a couple times, and I saw him a couple times. It was incredible moments to be able to meet him and, and hear him play a little bit. He would always send cassette tapes of his gigs. He would record them at his gigs, and he would send them through the mail to us, to Brazil, I always felt his music was very powerful. And I believe that was the real connection between me and my grandpa. That was the strong connection we had, the music. And at times when I play, actually, I feel his presence <laughs> is quite powerful. So on this track, this was recorded on, on one of my first albums. And I recorded it with the organ. A friend of mine, a sax player, Bruno Medina, and Rafael dos Santos was the, is the drummer. So this is called Blues for Sanders.
Listening to the music of pianist Serge Frazenkiewicz from Brasilia, Brazil. He's an arranger, composer, and educator. Serge has an early education bilingual school based on the arts called Affinity Arts. And we had just listened to the first piece that he selected for the interview. So why don't you tell us about the next piece that you chose to play? This next piece is an original song called No Trilho do Samba. No trilho do samba means on the train track of samba. And it's an opening tune to an album called Primeira Viagem, which means first voyage. And this was recorded with one of my trios. I have several groups. This trio is called the Som Trio. I like this track a lot because it's in the samba jazz style. It's a blend of jazz with samba. And I feel it really works so well. Brazilian rhythms are so rich and so diverse that it has been used by so many jazz musicians all, all over the world because it is such a rich source of brilliant rhythmic ideas. So samba on this track is just one of the many rhythmic styles we have in Brazil.
We're listening to the music of pianist Serge Frazenkevich from Brasilia, Brazil. He's an arranger, composer, and educator, and Serge has an early education bilingual school based on the arts called Affinity Arts. So what's the next piece you want to feature, Serge? This next piece is called De Pai para Filha, which means from father to daughter. This track is also on the Primeira Viagem CD. You can find it, this album on, on Spotify, YouTube, and other platforms. But I composed this song for my wonderful daughter, Nikki. Gosh, she's such a, an amazing girl. And I wanted to run away a little bit from the delicate and fragile stereotypes that usually musicians compose when they make a tribute to their children. Nikki is a little bit different. She is full of energy. She is happy. She is curious. She is adventurous, funny, and intense. So I tried to make a tune that could kind of portray this feeling about her.
listening to the music of Serge Frazenkevich from Brasilia, Brazil. He's an arranger, composer, and educator, and Serge has an early education bilingual school based on the arts called Affinity Arts. So, Serge, what's the next piece you chose? This next piece is called Chuva no Sertão, which means rain in the Sertão. The Sertão is located in in the northeastern part of Brazil. It's a region that's like a desert. And it only rains probably a couple months during a year, sometimes only one one time, one month a, a year. I was invited to compose a movement by the Geneva Water Hub to be a part of the Symphony for Water and Peace. This symphony was a collaboration of different composers from different parts of the world where each one composed a movement. Uh, speaking of the Geneva Water Hub, I think it's really a really interesting organization. Its main goal is to create connections to prevent and help solve water-related conflicts in the world. And they promote the use of water as an instrument of peace. So they have several projects, and, and they work with art, and they use art to try to inspire people the big necessity of water. So the first part of this piece, I try to portray the difficult settings in the Sirtão, the desert land, the poverty, the famine, the suffering of the population in these areas in northeastern Brazil. The first part of the song, of the movement, is like a chant. It's like a prayer of hope for rain. Then... On the second part is when the rain finally comes. You can really feel the freshness of the rain coming finally. And the population rejoices and celebrates. This part is based on a bayon. A bayon is a typical musical style from that region. And there's many bayons that people dance to. So it's a very festive quality about the bayon.
listening to the music of Serge Frazenkevich from Brasilia, Brazil. He's an arranger, composer, and educator, and Serge has an early education bilingual school based on the arts called Affinity Arts. So Serge, where can people find your music? You can find all my links through my Instagram profile, and that's at Serge Jazz. That's S-E-R-G-E Jazz. And there's a link tree that will direct you to my YouTube channel and to Spotify channels as well. Well, Serge, I want to thank you so much for sharing your story and your Affinity Arts International School and, of course, your music. Thank you so much for taking this time to share all that with us. Thank you, Warren, for the opportunity. It's been a big pleasure. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Serge Frazenkevich, an accomplished jazz pianist, arranger, composer, and educator. Serge has an early education bilingual school based on the arts called Affinity Arts International School. You can find links to his music at Serge Jazz on Instagram. After closing this program, you'll hear Serge's rendition of Dizzy Gillespie's Salt Peanuts. You can find this interview and other interviews on the website abahighperspective.com and on the YouTube channel Abahai Perspective. You can also find the podcast on Spotify and iTunes. For information specifically on the Baha'i faith, you can go to the website baha'i.org or you can call the number 1-800-22-UNITE. I hope you join me next time on A Baha'i Perspective.
Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, guys.